Hey guys, you're watching Python tutorial videos on my YouTube channel, Python for Microscopists. In today's tutorial, let's have a look at topology of deep neural networks. In fact, this should have been the first, uh, one of my first videos, but it's never too late. Now, well, in case you don't know what topology is, topology is basically how uh, uh, various components, you know, of some system or something, you know, are interrelated and arranged. So we're talking about deep learning. So what we mean is how are various components of our deep neural networks uh, are interrelated and arranged. Now let's actually build our model, okay, from scratch. Well, we'll be copying stuff from somewhere, but then at least uh, let's go through the thought process of building the model, okay? Now, for that, the first question you typically ask is, is your challenge a regression problem, a multi-class, or a binary classification, or a multi-channel? So there are various or natural language processing. So the, the when we say deep neural networks, it's pretty broad, right? So first of all, you have to pin it down to what example it is. Now, in case you don't know what this multi-label, multi-class, uh, maybe I'll create a bunch of videos on uh, each of this topic and then possibly uh, explain each of uh, uh, each of them using you know uh, uh, a specific example, but uh, for today let's actually focus on uh, multi-class challenge because I think that's uh, probably a very intuitive and easy example because we would be classifying a dog as a dog, a uh, you know a cat as a cat, an airplane as an airplane using our CIFAR10 data set. Okay, so let's jump in uh, and uh, not talk much, but actually see a lot of code. Uh, well, when I say a lot, don't be intimidated, but relevant code. Okay, so uh, first of all, before you create your model, the first thing you do is, okay, uh, by default, I usually import a whole bunch of Keras. Uh, I like to work with Keras, okay? So I uh, import a whole bunch of uh, Keras, uh, uh, you know, libraries that are, uh, or modules that are important, like convolutional 2D layers, because we need to create, you know, convolutional 2D operations, max pooling, dense, uh, and flatten, okay? Dense for the dense layers and so on. And I'm importing CIFAR10, CIFAR10 data set, and this is the one where you have about, I think, uh, uh, 60,000 images. Each image is 32 by 32 pixel size, and you have about 10 labels, including cat, dog, airplane, and a whole bunch of others, okay? Go ahead and Google that, uh, search for that, uh, if you want more information. Now, I'm also importing normalize, two categorical dropout. And again, I talked about these in one of my previous tutorials about the importance of normalizing your data, batch normalizing your data, and then uh, uh, so on, okay? And also optimizers, I'm importing stochastic gradient descent. Now you can use a bunch of other optimizers like Adam. Again, I'm prepared videos on this, so I don't wanna talk about each of this aspect, but I assume that you have a knowledge of, okay? So these things exist as my tools, how do I arrange them? So the first challenge is, uh, 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 let's actually get inspiration from uh, an existing uh, architecture. And for any of these classification problems like uh, VGG can be a great inspiration, okay? Uh, just Google search for VGG 16. And you can see, uh, you can actually even get your hands onto some of these uh, code out there. There's a lot of code on GitHub, but for now, I just want to understand the topology here, okay? Which is, okay, you have a convolutional layer one, convolutional layer one, right? So within this, there are two, con within this block, there are two convolutional layers and then max pooling. Two convolutional layers and then pooling, and then three convolutional layers and pooling. Okay, that gives me a good starting point. So let's come down here. And now let's start by importing the data and understanding the data, okay? So actually, uh, let I have created, a, let me go ahead and copy some lines of code. So let's uh, import this, so I don't waste your time basically. So the way you import this data set for, uh, is by running these lines, right? So now we have our X train, Y train, X test and Y test, which is loaded from our CIFAR10 data set, which is already part of uh, this. Now, obviously, if you're loading your own data, then go ahead and load your data and then separate it into training and testing. So, um, okay, using, again, that's the technique, we know how to do it. So uh, this is also a key part of our topology, right? I mean, this doesn't define the model, but it defines that, okay, you need to separate your data into train and validation or test data set so you can validate it. If you have a different data set altogether for validation, fine, 
Okay, so that part you need to understand. So let's go ahead and plot the first few images to have a quick look at exactly what we are dealing with. Okay, so here again, these are 32 by 32 pixels, so it's not always clear what they are, but in this case, I see some sort of a bird here, a horse, boat, uh, I don't know, that looks like a frog and a bus and truck, car, and so on. Okay. Uh, and again, you can go ahead and uh, study, you know, what else is there. I see airplanes, automobiles, birds, and uh, cat, deer, dog, frog, and so on. Okay, so once we have this, let's remove the lines about plotting. This is only to understanding. Uh, again, I'll share the code with you, so don't worry. Don't bother uh, freezing the screen and writing down or something. So I want you to pay attention to how the thought process is here. The first step one. I want my data to be ready, okay? It's ready right now. Step two, well, uh, the data is imported, but is it actually uh, normalized? If you actually look up here, my X train and uh, uh, right there is 32 by 32 by three. If you look at the values, these are all unsigned integer eight going from zero to 255 because these are all uh, uh, eight bit images. Yeah, pixel value goes from zero to 255. And I did talk about the importance of scaling and normalization in my previous tutorial. So let's start by normalizing this data. And how do we do that? Again, uh, we imported the normalize. I mean, there are multiple ways to do in that. Uh, one is just to take your X-train and divide by 255. You're all set. But uh, I'm actually using this normalize right here that I imported from keras.utils. And then I'm just applying the normalize over there. Okay, so that's step one. Now, again, we are doing this multi-class problem. So if you look at your Y train or Y test, if you look at this, this is like one single column of values ranging from zero to nine. This is not ideal for your classification. You want these data to be in a categorical format. Again, I prepared, I made a video, go ahead and watch that about what does that actually mean. But let's go ahead and run this and look at the output so you get an idea of how that looks like. So now if you look at this, for each of these categories, zero through nine, you have this one hot encoded which means only one pixel has a value of one and everything else should be zero in that row. Okay, so that's one hot encoding. Meaning this image is whatever that label one is, this image is that label. Okay, that's what that's basically uh, telling us. So this is how the input looks like. Okay, so now we have our input ready. Now let's go ahead and uh, uh, try to implement this, uh, define our model. Okay, so first let's actually do only the first block, which is two convolutions and pooling. And then let's take a couple of dense layers, okay? So how uh, do we do that? And again, uh, I have written a few lines of code, so you don't waste your time. Now coming down, and there you go. Okay, so what did I do? I defined two convolutional layers and a max pooling, and then two dense layers, okay? That's exactly what we're doing. Two convolutional pooling, and then, well, you could add another dense if you want, but I'm just doing two for now, okay? Now, uh, I started with, again, uh, you can experiment with any numbers right there, okay? You can try 16. Uh, I am, in, you know, taking inspiration from VGG. By the way, if you just copy directly the VGG architecture, I believe they require images in 242 by 242 pixel size, I think, for their input if you use their own uh, architecture. But uh, uh, feel free to change these and then see how that affects. I usually leave my kernel size to be 3 by 3 right here and then two by two for max pooling. Okay, for convolution three by three and for max pooling two by two. And also for activation, again, I talked about this in the previous tutorial. For activation, let's go ahead and use ReLU for the uh, hidden layers and for these, uh, uh, the final one, I'm gonna use softmax because again, multi-class problem. If it is a binary, then it would be sigmoid, for example, or even for other regression type of analysis, maybe uh, other type of activations. But for multi-class problem, always, always try to use softmax. Again, experiment with others if you want. Now, kernel initializer is, uh, uh, HE uniform is a good one. Again, uh, this is, uh, uh, kernel initializer is basically, it initializes the weights. The better the initialization is, or the closer the initialization, initial weights are to the real answer, the faster this training happens, right? So that's what that is. And my input shape is 32 by 32 by three. Uh, 
so that's uh, and and it's 32 by 32 by 3 because my images are already 32 by 32 if not you may have to add another step here to resize your images right to the right size and i've done this in many of my previous tutorials again i'm not going to waste your time talking about that stuff Okay, so we have this and then uh, the dense layers. And before the dense layers, obviously you're going to flatten it because dense layers means uh, you, uh, convolution is two dimensional and dense layers is one dimensional. Think of it that way, okay? So you're flattening all your two dimensional information into 1D right there. And then I'm doing 128 and always, always the output, the final layer should have the same number of outputs as your predictions, as your number of classes. So we have 10 different classes here in this data set. So my output is going to be uh, 10 here, okay? And uh, we are using softmax and again softmax, if I remember right, softmax actually outputs probability of each of these dense layers, thinking that this is mutually exclusive, meaning if it is a cat, it cannot be a dog, right? So that's the way the probability is and when you add all the probabilities, it should add up to one. I think that's how softmax uh, works. Sigmoid, on the other hand, it gives you probability, so it can be by thinking that it's not mutually exclusive, okay? So uh, the probabilities do not add up to one, but it tells you that, hey, this image is probably 0.6% or 60% dog or 30% cat and so on, okay? And uh, so after defining this, I'm gonna define a, my optimizer as a stochastic gradient descent with a learning rate of 0 0.001 and a momentum of 0 0.9. And again, momentum defines how fast uh, your training. And again, momentum is the push that it gives in case you have local minima, okay? Again, watch my tutorial previous to, uh, for most of these questions that you may have when I'm talking about this, the answer is probably lying in one of my previous tutorials. That's my way of marketing my own videos. Go ahead and watch those other tutorials because I cannot just keep talking about every little aspect in every video, then it makes every video to be boringly long. Okay, I bet this is already getting boringly long for you guys, some of you guys. Okay, so this is the optimizer I'm using. Also experiment with other optimizers like Adam, for example, is a great optimizer that I use. And what loss to monitor, cat, uh, uh, well, what lo uh, loss function are you using? I'm gonna use categorical cross entropy because this is a multi-class problem. For binary, it would be binary cross entropy. And for regression, it could be mean squared error and some others. And metrics to uh, track uh, for each epoch, I'm tracking accuracy, so I can go ahead and plot the validation accuracy and uh, the train accuracy. So this is it, this is my model, I defined it. Now let's go ahead and uh, fit our data to this uh, specific model. And uh, how do you do that? And before even jumping into that, I am going to create, again, I'm going to use all the stuff that I talked about in the past in this video. So I'm gonna, which makes it, if you have time only for one video, maybe this is good enough. Okay, so let's separate this. So here I'm going to use data augmentation. So I'm going to randomly, again, this improves your training. So this is my data augmentation step. So uh, my uh, model.fit is basically model.fit, uh, uh, let's go ahead and copy those lines. In fact, we do not need data augmentation here. I'm just including it so you know uh, about it. As you can see, I'm basically uh, training it on my X train and Y train. So let's uh, let's not do this then. Okay, let's not do that. And. Uh, um, Sorry, I keep changing my mind when I, uh, because this actually does a great job, let's actually uh, use it and sorry, this is uh, model one, right? How do we fit? How do we fit a model? What is our model name? Model one dot fit. But since I want to use my uh, generator here, I'm going to change this on the fly and hopefully there's uh, no issues here. Model dot fit underscore generator, okay? fit generator, which means I'm not gonna give it X train and Y train. I'm just going to give it uh, uh, the generator. So I'm gonna just say train underscore, where is my generator, train underscore generator. That's what I called it, okay? This is the image, the uh, generator that's supplying images uh, uh, while it's training, okay? I'm not gen uh, doing data gen saving images to my folder, but I'm generating it on the fly, okay? So let's go ahead and do this part. Uh, and then my number of epochs for now, let's go ahead and do uh, this. And instead of batch size, because we are actually, let's remove all of this. Sorry about changing these, but 
at least you learn let's actually do batch size okay and let's do 32 okay so i think that should do batch size oh sorry not batch size i wanted to do steps per epoch steps i think this is how you define it steps per epoch equals to let's just do 500 uh, for now okay steps per epoch and we have this and uh, by the way if you want you can actually include your validation data here okay so uh, let's go ahead and i shouldn't have deleted that validation data you can hold out part of this as validation data uh, you know when you're defining your uh, inputs but since we already have our test let's go ahead and do that validation data is uh, is uh, let's see x did I use uppercase x test and y underscore test okay I have a feeling this is going to be a very large video long video I should say and let me put everything into one screen so you guys can see it uh, okay x underscore test oh, God x underscore test and why is it yelling at me yeah it's there x underscore test and y underscore test that's what we are going to use x y okay so that works fine and then we can evaluate model later okay so we haven't still talked a lot about topology yet but we'll get there in the next few minutes okay for that i'll just go ahead and copy and paste but this uh, part i wanted to go a bit slow okay so uh, so let's go ahead and look at model dot one uh, evaluate after it's done okay how do we evaluate it model dot one evaluate x test and y test let's just look at our accuracy values there's a lot more you can do but the, let's just go ahead and uh, uh, plot let's go ahead and plot our curves again this is something i do with every part of my training process i know i can hear you guys forwarding my video for sure because it's getting long but uh I'm glad you are still sticking through. Okay, so this is it. So what have we done? We defined our model. We gave it uh, a name called model one because I want to add model three, model five. Uh, in this model, two convolutions and uh, two dense, and then we are using stochastic gradient descent. And I'm uh, using the generator to actually uh, to provide uh, uh, you know my inputs to this and then let's only do uh, 10 epochs okay so we can look at the results and finally i'm actually pre uh, uh, printing out the accuracy by multiplying my model dot evaluate value by 100 percent so to look at this and i'm plotting my loss uh, training loss and validation loss and uh, training accuracy and validation accuracy this is it so let's go ahead and run this Okay, so let's have a quick look at this. So the final accuracy is 42.47%, not great, obviously. And uh, the good news is these two seem to be uh, doing fine. You see the training loss is coming down, the validation loss is also uh, doing a good job. And then the validation accuracy is improving and the training accuracy. It's interesting that the validation accuracy is higher than the training accuracy. And I'll let you investigate why that could be the case. But uh, usually the train uh, the the validation is lower than the training accuracy. Okay, so uh, now uh, again I'll pause the next part of uh, you know the training. But what I would like to do is now let's actually add. Uh, I'll share the code again. So let's actually add this part. So what I'm doing is uh, removing this model and adding a different model. Again, it seems like a lot of stuff going on. But in this example, what I've done is. The, uh, defining the first three of these blocks, yeah? Con two convolutions, pooling, two convolutions, pooling, and three convolutions and pooling. That's exactly what you see here. Two convolutions, pooling, two convolutions, pooling, three, pooling, everything else I left the same, okay? So now model three, so let's go ahead and change this to instead. In fact, I should have just used model. Okay, so model three, and I think that should do. And I'll run this again, I'll pause the video, and then we can have a uh, look at the result, okay? So hopefully, I'm hoping for a higher accuracy than 42.47. Uh, so let's go ahead and see that. So let's run this, and I'll pause the video. Okay, so here it is. Uh, so we got 47.22, not, again, uh, some improvement uh, compared to you know earlier but not as much and uh, uh, the the fact that again the validation is higher than uh, training accuracy 
tells me that it's still trying to train it uh, a bit better. In fact, if you let, uh, let it go for like 300, 400 epochs, you can see that, okay, the training is eventually getting better. And also maybe I can, so I could have supplied a lot more images to training, but let's not worry about that. Let's not change the experiment right now. But one thing uh, that, that let's do is uh, see if uh, dropout has an effect, okay? So here I'm actually adding dropout. Again, I talked about dropout in one of my previous tutorials the importance of dropout uh, prevents overfitting okay although that's not the case in our uh, case at least not clearly visible but let's uh, exactly the same as before the previous model now i'm actually adding dropout of 20 percent to each of these layers again this is the topology that i'm talking about okay what happens how you when you add something, when you not add something. Of course, there's research going on from a fundamental point of view to understand exactly the effect of each of these. But again, depends completely on the type of uh, uh, challenge that you're working on. So let's go ahead and run this again. I'll pause the video and let's look at the results. Well, that definitely did not seem to improve. Again, here are the curves and uh, the uh, it's 43.18%. And by the way, uh, halfway through this, I realized that, okay, I didn't change the model name, so I changed it to model three drop, which is the right one, right? Where we are using dropout and I cleared all the variables, so no effect from the previous runs uh, 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 is on this data. So let's do this final thing. And dropout, again, uh, go ahead and try it on your data sets. Uh, now here, I'm doing the whole bit. Now I'm doing dropout. But more importantly, I'm doing batch normalization. I hope this has a huge effect because typically, again, this is, I should have practiced this, but this is the first time I'm, uh, I'm doing while I'm training here, while I'm teaching on the camera. So I'll be equally surprised or not surprised with the results. Okay, so batch normalization for each convolutional layer right there, okay? And I seriously hope that this is going to uh, help out, okay? So batch normalization always lives up to expectations. So let me copy this name so I don't repeat the same mistake I did earlier. So let's go ahead and do that. Batch normalization. Okay, dropping and normalization together and I'm gonna clear all the variables over there and let's go ahead and run this. I'll pause the video, let's look at the results. Okay, so there you go. Uh, let's see, some improvement, obviously 50%. It's uh, definitely improvement. I think we are kind of dragged down by our dropout layers. I have a feeling that the dropout layers are not helping us. So uh, this can be very addictive. I can spend a lot of time trying to change this topology and see how it affects my uh, output. So I'll do one more thing, just drop out and then see how the results look like. But I also started to realize that my training data is so small that my validation and my validation is large. So if, if you want, you can actually do all 50,000 images uh, for training and then 10,000 for testing. You'll definitely get much better results, but I don't want to uh, you know, spend half an hour for each of these runs as part of this tutorial, but I'll uh, give you the code and you can try that out. So uh, let me run one more. I'll pause the video, but I'll delete all the dropouts and I'll do one more and let's quickly have a result, uh, you know, uh, look at the result. So, uh, so we can see the effect or the negative effect of dropout. Maybe there is. I, that's my suspicion, but let's confirm that. Okay, there you go. Now things started to look a bit, bit more realistic, right? I mean, now you see the validation jumping up and down, and this is how it's supposed to be typically. Uh, and uh, now we have 57.58%. So removing the dropout definitely helped a lot uh, for us. And uh, that's probably because my dropout was a bit more intense, right? I mean, I had initially 20% and then 40% and 50% of dropout. So the, it's, it's, it's not, I mean, for these many epochs, it's not training uh, very well, it's not enough. Maybe we need to add a lot more epochs to actually get there uh, to see uh, some results. But anyway, dropout wasn't the thing for now. Now, uh, one final thing I promise, uh, I really do not want to use this model and then basically use the first one earlier not by using data generator, but by using all 50,000 of my uh, data points for X and then my 10,000 uh, uh, for uh, uh, testing purposes. I'll still do 10 epochs, but I don't know how long this is gonna take, but let's go ahead and look at the result because I have been very curious why my training loss and validation losses were a bit weird, okay? Uh, again, I'll pause the video so uh, it won't be a waste of your time. Just uh, 
so take some time from my side. So let's go ahead and run this uh, uh, quickly. Let's make sure model three drop norm, model three dot norm. And the only thing I changed is this part. Okay, cool. Let's run this and then uh, let's continue after this pause. Okay, so looks like things are looking normal with uh, the actual data, that, uh, you know, by using the actual data. So you see how the validation accuracy, the training accuracy is near, like about above 90%, and the validation accuracy is about, uh, uh, let's go ahead and look at it, is about 68.24%, much better than before. Obviously we had 57 or something, and the loss also uh, looks almost normal now. You can play with the topology. Let's go ahead. I mean, I'll let you do this. Go ahead and add more of these, uh, you know, convolutional layers and uh, try to engineer the batch normalization and maybe adding dropout now, now that we have a lot of data can uh, help. But then again, our problem is not overfitting here, right? So, uh, or maybe it is. So adding dropout can definitely help. Looks like our Training is doing a much better job than validation here. So maybe it is overfitting a little bit, yeah? Maybe adding dropout definitely helps here. So there's a lot to talk about and I can make this video much longer, but I think I should stop now. So I'll share this code, go ahead and experiment yourself. But I hope you found this to be not just boring because it's pretty long, I admit, but uh, also informative. And uh, let's again, uh, I think uh, in the next few tutorials, I'll start to define what regression is and uh, just show some examples like I promised earlier. So please stay tuned for that. And until then, please subscribe to this channel. Thank you very much for your attention and patience.